Welcome back to the fourth installation in the Making Sense of Enmia 0183 Sentences series. And as I promised in the previous, the third part, Cartier, link in the description, I will decode the last four sentences we get from our uBlocks GPS receiver. And also, as I promised, we will not go over every single line of code. I need to do that. I will just point out some highlights because, yeah, most of the heavy lifting we've already done. And afterwards, if there's still some time, we should objectify our code a little bit more. So enjoy. Let's start with the last data field type we have not covered in part two. And that's a numeric type and according to the standard, a variable length floating point. And of course, in many of the sentences, it's nullable. So the thing here is it doesn't have to be a real float. <laughs> it can be just a variable length integer. And it can have a sign, but only a minus sign, not a plus sign in front of it. And it needs to have at least one digit before the decimal point. And I call that a float, yeah, nullable. The first additional sentence I want to decode is GGA. Global Positioning System GPS Fixed Data, which gives you the time, date, position, course and speed. And it starts with a time, so the universal time coordinate of the position fix. Then comes the coordinate itself. We already saw that combination of four fields, latitude, north, south, longitude, east, west followed by a GPS quality indicator. So digits zero to eight. Uh, please note, this is not a linear scale. So the first two, I think, uh, or the very first zero, no fix is of course bad. Then uh, one SPS mode or two differential GPS mode. These are the good modes. And the rest is then deteriorating again. So you have a PPS mode. I'm not quite sure what that is. Then uh, in Tetra RTK and uh, float RTK. Well, in fact, float RTK should they yield you better results, position results, than the integer RTK method. Uh, yeah, I'm not going into the details here. Then an estimated position, uh, manually entered or eight simulator, so simulated data. Then comes two digits, a uh, number of satellites in use between 00, 0 and 12. Then comes another float, which gives you the horizontal dilution of your position, so in 2D space. Then comes the antenna altitude above uh, slash below. <laughs> yeah, it could be negative sea level because that's the average sea level. Then the unit of this, which is always meters, and then comes another float uh, of both nullable, by the way, uh, the geo geoidal separation. So GPS coordinates are normally given uh, as a reference to the VGS 84 Earth ellipsoid. As you might know, Earth is not flat, uh, but it's also not really a perfect sphere. So in 1984, they decided to make a model, a mathematical model in form of an ellipsoid, which approximates the form of the Earth. Problem is that the mean sea level, yeah, which we are referencing here, <laughs> does not always agree with this ellipsoid. So you get the difference here in that number, and that's also always given in meters. Finally, we have another nullable float. That's the age of the differential GPS data. If you are running in dif differential GPS modes in seconds and the station ID, that's four digits 0000, 0, 0, 0 to 1023, so 10 bits internally of the differential reference station you are using. Number two, GSA. 
the Global Navigation Satellite System Delusion of Position and Active Satellite Sentence. Uh, it gives you some more information. Uh, first, uh, if your GNSS system is running in 2D or 3D mode, so including the vertical position. The IDs of the active satellites are used by the GNSS system. The dilution of position and the GNSS system used. It starts with a letter M or A indicating if the switching between the 2D and 3D mode is manually done or automatic. Then comes a digit 1, 2 or 3 indicating if there's no fix from the system or if it's working in 2D mode or 3D mode. Then come the 12 IDs, two digits each, 0 to 99 of the active satellites. Of course, all fields here are nullable. Followed by the three dilution of position values here as a float. Yeah, we introduced that data type. So first the polu uh, position positional dilution of position in 3D, so including the vertical dilution. Then the horizontal dilution of position, so just the dilution in 2D. And finally, the vertical dilution of position, so just the dilution of the height. That is optionally, yeah, in newer versions, followed by a 0 to 9 or A to F, indicating what kind of system has produced the data. So GPS, GLOSNAS or Galileo. Number three, RMC, the recommended minimum specific GNSS data, which gives you the time and the date of your position fix, the course and the speed. And it starts with the time of the position fix and then comes our beloved warning flag here. So a letter A for valid and V for warning. Our four fields here giving us the position as before, then a float which gives us the speed over ground in knots, then a float giving us our course over ground in degrees true, then comes six digits giving us the date of the position fix in the format day day, month month, year year. Then two fields giving us the magnetic variation at our current position in yeah the float and if the variation is to the east or to the west. Then comes another letter <laughs> indicating the position system mode. So if our status is valid, we can only have the letters A for autonomous and D for differential GPS here. If we have V for warning here, we can have E for estimated position, F for float RTK, M for manual, N for no fix, P for precise, but yeah, still warning, so not as precise as autonomous or differential, obviously, R for integer RTK, S for simulator. This is an optional field only available in version 2.3 and after. Then we have another optional field which is only available somewhere after version 3.01 and that's the navigational status. Again, a single letter is S for safe, C for caution, U for unsafe and V for invalid. This is something new we haven't seen before and I will point out in the code how I implemented that. Last but not least, number four, VTG, course over ground and ground speed, which gives you the degrees true heading and magnetic heading, the speed in knots and kilometers per hour. So it starts with a float, that's our course over ground in degrees true, which is always followed by a T for true degrees. Then a float course over ground in degrees magnetic, which is always followed by a M for magnetic degrees. Then a float speed over ground in knots, always followed by a N for knots. And a float speed over ground in kilometers per hour, always followed by a K. 
And at the very end we have a letter indicating the source device mode. So A for autonomous, D for differential, E for estimated, M for manual, P for precise, S for simulator and N for not valid. Please note this sentence is not a GNSS sentence but a general navigation sentence. It just happens that our U-Blocks GPS receiver also delivers that sentence. The code or at least uh, the parts I will <laughs> show. Anyway, we have here a uh, type def for our float and MIA parametric fields float and here you see the first struct I defined newly for the GGA sentences and I have three more of these structs of course for the other three sentences. I've added these four new structs within the union on inside our NMIA parametrics field struct. So here's the first one NMIA parametric fields GGA, GGA. And before I forget it, I also of course extended our enum class and MIA parametric fields type with the four new types of sentences here. Again, the first one is the GGA. Inside our virtual and MIA parametric fields handler class, I've added these helper function to decode and print these and MIA parametric fields float thingies here. So here's decode float and here's print float. Of course, I also added four new handler classes for our four new sentences and we will have a closer look at the NMEA parametric fields handler RMC class, specifically its decode method. You remember there were two fields at the end, at the very end of the message and that was the mode field which came in version 2.3 and later and then the navigation field that came in version somewhere after 3.01. So if the field count is greater than 11, indicating a sentence version of 2.3 or later, then I decode the mode field. And only then I check if the field count is even greater than 12, indicating an even newer version. And then I check for the navigation field. If it's before that version wise, then I set the navigation field to 127. Remember that was a char, 127 is the del delete character and I'm using that to indicate that a field was not included in a message at all. So not nulled, just empty, but really not included. And if we are in a version pre 2.3, I do that for both fields, the mode and navigation field. Finally, I instantiate a single object for each of my new handler classes. So here that's the line for the GGA sentences. And I add a pointer to each of these objects to my NMIA parametric fields handler array. That's it. Almost. I also made a little change to the loop. So I only print out the raw form of the sentence, so the 82 character string, if I wasn't able to decode the sentence, okay? Now let's have a look at the serial monitor. So our little Arduino is decoding away nicely. Let's see if we can find our new sentence types here somewhere. So let's start uh, in the order with the GGA. Here it is. So our UTC time of the position fix. Yeah, it's late afternoon here. Our position, that's good. Our quality indicator is one, that's normal GPS. Our horizontal dilution of position is 1.4. We are at an altitude about main sea level of 295, um, 296 meters. And we are separated here. Uh, the main sea level is separated from the uh, VGS 
84 Earth ellipsoid by 74.6 meters. I didn't know that GPS is actually transmitting that information. And yeah, of course, the data for differential GPS, uh, so the age and the uh, reference station ID is both null. So let's look for our GSA sentence. Uh, yeah, here we have two of them. Both are coming from the talk of GN. Uh, hmm. That's interesting. We cannot decide what it is what. But uh, anyway, the uh, 2D, 3D uh, switching is on auto and uh, both on, uh, on 3D. Here we have our satellite IDs that are in actual use. So here five and here three of them. And then we have the uh, data for the positional dilution of a position. So in 3D for the horizontal, so only in 2D and for the vertical, so only in 1D. That looks nice. Then uh, we did the RMC the recommended minimum specific GNSS data. So again, the time of the fix and our data is valid, no warning. We have our position. We have here our speed over ground and that's of course not a real speed. That's just the variation in the position fix that gives us a speed here. And uh, that's obviously too small to give us a course or too random. I guess that will change as soon as the GPS receiver is really moving. We have the date of the fix and then we have here the data for the magnetic deviation or declination, which is of course null. The GPS receiver can't know about that. And our position system mode is A for autonomous, so normal GPS. And the last field here, the navigational status is completely missing from our sentence we received. So yeah, it is what it is. It's a very old firmware. And finally, VTG, yeah, here it is. So yeah, again, uh, cause in true degrees and cause in magnetic has to be null. We have that pseudo speed here, just the variation in the GPA fix. And we have mode A, so also autonomous normal GPS. Great. Now, how can we objectify the whole shebang a wee bit more? For that, let's take a few steps back to the beginning and also review what we've done so far. In the very first part, card here, link in the description, I showed you a picture like that. We have an Enmia talker and that's sending a sentence or sentences to an Enmia listener. And at first glance, we see, of course, we have three types of objects here. Talkers, sentences and listeners. And indeed we implemented so far for the listener, an abstract class and Mia listener and an implementation of that was the and Mia listener hardware serial class. And that has the main method pull sentence, which gives us an and Mia sentence. And at some point we will do exactly the same for the talker. So an abstract class and Mia talker implementation of that and Mia talker hardware serial. And that will have the main method push sentence, which will get an and Mia sentence. So an and Mia sentence clearly here, as you remember, is just a string of characters. Currently, we take that string of characters, so the Enmia sentence, and put it into some, yeah, the blue cloud here, procedural code that uses at the end the Enmia parametric fields handler virtual class and the implementation of that Enmia parametric fields handlers xxx to decode the Enmia parametric fields included in that string of characters. And the whole code here builds up a struct Enmia data content that mainly contains our Enmia address field and our Enmia parametric fields. So a sentence is a struct of fields. 
Wait, a second ago a sentence was a string of characters. Now it's a struct of fields. And if you look at that picture here, it is in fact when it travels between a talker and a listener, just an electrical signal. So using sentence as an object is maybe not as clean cut as uh, this picture here suggests. So let's have a look at it from another more information flow oriented perspective. So currently we start with just the listener hardware, which is abstracted here in our NMIA listener hardware serial, which has the method pull sentence and gives us an NMIA sentence as a string of characters. And then I propose a new top level class NMIA codec so encoder decoder, which currently will have one method decode that gets a sentence and delivers us the whole and MIA data content struct of fields. That top level codec class is using or will use currently just an NMIA codec parametric class which can decode parametric sentences. You remember there are three other types of sentences so there will be three more classes like that. Also having a decode function getting the right data from our top level class and delivering us here inside our struct the NMIA parametric fields. And that codec parametric is basically just choosing the right NMIA parametric fields handler XXX to do that decode of the parametric fields. This architecture strictly separates between functionality and data. That is admittedly not very object oriented. You would expect the objects to contain the data. But I have several reasons not to do that. One of the main reasons being memory usage. Remember we are implementing here for a microcontroller. If our objects here would contain the data and we would instantiate here at the bottom level each and every NMIA parametric fields handler class uh, at least once in an object included in our NMIA parametric fields handler array, we would eat up an enormous amount of RAM. Anyway, this architecture is also very symmetric. You can reverse it. Just add here also encode methods and push an EMEA data content into it and you get out an EMEA sentence which you can push via a push sentence method into a future implementation EMEA talker hardware serial. Now let's have a look at the code and I will be jumping between the old version of the code and the new version implementing the NMIA codec and NMIA codec parametric class and show you how I integrated all that procedural stuff into the new classes. So that's on the old version, version 8, our NMIA decode function, which will now become the decode method of the new NMIA codec class. Remember that big switch statement here that determines what kind of sentence we're dealing here with. And we also use inside that function that whole NMIA decode address stuff here, decode approved address, decode query address and the third type of address, decode proprietary address. We also had an NMIA print data content function and that will become a print method for that new NMIA codec. And this is also a lot of case statements and it's called some subroutines here, sub functions uh, for printing the address fields that will be also encapsulated in that class. 
And here's in the new code version, version 9, the new class and Mia codec. And its constructor gets as an argument our NMIA parametric fields handler array and the size of that array. But that's just passed down to another new class, which we'll talk about in a second, the NMIA codec parametric, which will get that as an argument to its oops config method. Then we have the decode method that replaces our C function for decoding. It has the same syntax. So it gets here a constant and mere sentence as an argument and it returns the and mere data content. The body of the function itself, it's almost copy and paste. I'm just using here for the address stuff now private methods, decode approved address, decode proprietary address and decode query address. And I'm now using here that new class object and Mia codec parametric decode to decode my parametric data content. And of course we have here also that print method which replaces the C print function also with the switch statement. I reorganized that a wee bit. Yeah, that was basically uh, two switch statements with an if statement in between. I don't know why I've done that. It's now a single switch statement and uh, depending on the type of our sentence, it does the correct actions. That includes also <laughs> calling the print method of our new codec parametric class object and uh, using private functions for printing the address fields. Uh, one more remark that print function gets of course a pointer to a print object as argument. So I'm no longer printing hard coded to serial but I can print to anything. Anyway, I also encapsulated a, a print, or that's a new written function, a print method for the NMIA sentences. So yeah, just so everything is wrapped nice and neatly. And then I have here my private members, which is of course that NMIA codec parametric, codec parametric, which we will have a look at in a second and the decode address stuff here for the query approved and proprietary address and the print address field here itself. Yeah, everything neatly encapsulated in one class. We are in the old code again and now we are going over the EMEA decode parametric field stuff which will go into the EMEA codec parametric class. So of course we have our function here and Mia sentence formatter number, we still need that. And we have here our and Mia job parametric fields function that will probably be a private method. And then we have here the and Mia decode parametric fields, which will of course become the decode method of the class. And remember, there's not much to it. It just goes through the array of handler and it finds uh, the correct handler. It decodes the fields using exactly that handler. And at the very end, we had that NMIA print parametric fields function, which will become the print method. Okay, also just a loop and then calling the print method of the correct handler. And here in the new code, we have the new class and Mia codec parametric. The constructor does absolutely nothing but sets two private member variables, our handler array and our handler count to a null pointer and to zero. The config method, we saw that being used already, it gets the handler array and the count of the handlers in the array and sets our private member variables accordingly. Then we have a public fun uh, method uh, decode and a public method print, which 
corresponds to the C function. Please note that the loop is no longer in here in this method. Instead, I'm using a new private method handler for for matter number, which returns the correct handler for a given for matter number. And then all I have to do is call the method from the handler to do a proper decode and a proper print. So that got a little bit smaller uh, code wise. I encapsulated here, of course, also our formatter number function, which gives us the unsigned integer for a three letter and mere formatter. And then in the private section, we have, yeah, we talked already about that, the handler array and the handler count variable, but I also keep an instant of the base handler class here as handler unknown. Okay, here comes my handler for formatter number function method, which includes the loop. A little change here. I no longer expect within the handler array uh, to be the last element, the handler unknown of the class and mere parametric fields handler. Instead, if I go through the array and don't find a handler for my formatter number, then I explicitly return the pointer to the handler unknown object. And also note, I no longer have here for formatter number returning boolean or for type returning boolean. I'm just using now formatter number to get the formatter number for a specific handler. And finally, I encapsulated here as a private method the chops field. That's all. I already mentioned a change to the NMIA parametric fields handler class and its derived classes for the different sentence type. I no longer have a for formatter number method or for sentence type method just checking that is returning a boolean if a handler is responsible for a certain formatter number or sentence type. Instead, I only have now a single method formatter number that returns the formatter number. I also got rid of that static class output variable here. Instead, I'm now always passing a pointer to a print object to do all my print stuff. The NMIA parametric fields handler array contains no longer, as mentioned at the very end, uh, object to the base class NMIA parametric fields handler. We don't need that anymore. And of course, I instantiate here a codec object of the class NMIA codec passing my NMIA parametric fields handler array and its size. And here are finally the according changes to the loop. So I'm no longer using C functions here to decode a sentence or to print a sentence. I'm using now the codec decode and the codec print. And I'm no longer using directly serial print here to print out unknown sentences. I also use here the codec print method. Please note that the new code has now 1449 lines of code, uses 15,622 bytes of flash and 453 bytes of RAM, while the old code has 1489 lines, so longer, uses 16,010 bytes of flash, so a wee bit more, uh, but also only 438 bytes of RAM. So all in all, our objectified code got a little bit more compact and smaller, but it does need a wee bit more RAM to handle in the background all these object instances, that two new object instances. And as you can see, the new object-oriented version of the code does of course exactly the same like the old uh, partly procedural code. 
that's it for today. Uh, quite a tour de force, I know. I try to keep these videos at about half an hour length, but this time, especially the second part, got a wee bit longer because I felt it necessary to have that theory insert about the classes I intended to use. I felt that was necessary to enable you to really understand what the code does and what my intentions are and where I'm going. Anyway, next up, proprietary sentences. And I'm not talking about decoding them, but encoding them and also writing a talker class so we can send them over to our Ublox GPS receiver. Till then, bye.